Hey guys, it's Geesebombs Completionist, and today I'm bringing you my very first ever The Nightmare Room TV show episode review. In today's video, we're going to be discussing Locker 13. And since Locker 13 doesn't have a home media release of any kind, I'm going to be overlaying an image right here. Now, I just want to get something off my chest before we go any further. I have zero childhood attachment to this series. I didn't have WB growing up. I think my grandparents might have had it with, like, satellite cable. <laughs> And I've visited them about once a month growing up, and I maybe have watched this show in the past. I can't remember, though. Uh, the only one I really do remember watching was when I rented a VHS when I was a kid from, like, Movie Time or Blockbuster or something like that with the Amanda Bynes episode, Don't Forget About Me. I remember that episode. But everything else is kind of new to me. And, I don't know, for... Me trying to pick an episode to start a series review, I sure did pick a pretty forgettable one. <laughs> this episode, I don't really know where to begin. Um, it has some really good stuff going for it. Um, this episode has the guy from the Phantasm movies playing the villain of the story. It has Ron Oliver directing this episode, and if you don't know who Ron Oliver is... You might know him from Are You Afraid of the Dark or Goosebumps. Ron Oliver did classic episodes from Are You Afraid of the Dark, like The Tale of the Dark Music. That's like a really good one. And he did some other iconic Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes as well. And then for Goosebumps, the three main ones I think he's known for are like the Werewolf Skin episode, the two-parter. He did the first Say Cheese and Die episode. And he did uh, the Cry of the Cat episode, which I know him best for because that's one of my personal favorite episodes. And I know his work seems kind of divisive in the Goosebumps field, but when I learned in the credits that Ron Oliver directed this episode, I was blown away by how forgettable this episode is. This takes me back to recently when I watched the Vampire Breath episode, and I don't really think Ron was the issue there. I think sometimes Ron just gets dealt bad scripts, and the script in this episode was written by a person named Richard Rosner. And I haven't looked any deeper into Richard Rosner's writing career, but if I had any guess, uh, this guy just looked at the book and just said, eh, you know, I'm just going to do my own thing here and just wrote willy-nilly whatever he wanted. Now, Nightmare Room is a 13-episode series. There was four original episodes for the show, and everything else was adaptations. I think only one other episode... Uh, was trying to combine three books into one, and then there was like one two-parter. It was it was kind of weird how they set up the show and how they did s certain episodes from just doing some research. But really, this episode comes off mildly insulting. <laughs> Not only to the fans of the Nightmare Room book series, but to the story of the Locker 13 in the, in the book version. This is just a baffling choice to go with. And, you know, I get the whole reality that they had to condense, like, sometimes 140-page books like Locker 13 and streamline it into 20 to 22-minute episodes. And this is a prime example I'm going to use for a while now to kind of justify my opinions about why certain episodes could have used 25 to 30 minutes. Because if they had that, they could have just did more of the book here. Um, but this, you know, this show also had like zero budget. I'm, I'm assuming they probably used the same school set for every single episode. That's what it looks like, at least. This show had like zero budget put into it. It, it takes a lot <laughs> for these episodes to stand out, I, I'm assuming. And this episode, if I had anything to say before we get into the plot overview, if you are a fan of the Nightmare Room series and you've never seen the TV show, just skip it. You're better off just reading the book instead of watching this episode. But just know that before I go any further, okay? I'm not recommending it, but if you absolutely have to watch it, there are some things to enjoy, and I'll get into that near the end of the video as well. So yeah, let's get into the plot overview without giving too much away. So Luke is still the main character like the book, and the opening kind of starts off in Luke's room. It's dark outside, and you can kind of look at his wall, and you see all these neurotic things about superstition the best thing i can compare luke to that i've seen in other arl stein works is mark from how i got my shrunken head book and episode 
Luke has this neurotic nature, and it comes through with the episode just like the book here. And Luke is having an apparent nightmare, and he looks over and sees this big wrestling guy, uh, like dressed in like traditional high school wrestling attire. And then he wakes up. <laughs> so off the bat, you're in a dream sequence. And <laughs> he wakes up, and the next day, it's the next day, and he looks at his calendar, and it says Friday the 13th. After seeing that, it cuts to the school, and he's, it's on Friday the 13th, he's at school, and it's revealed that he has a wrestling match later that day against this guy named Gomez, and he's worried about fighting him. And here, Luke is interacting with his friend Jeff. Now, Jeff, the guy who plays Jeff, he has been in some other movies from the 90s. I think he was in the Leave it to Beaver movie, I think he was in Jingle All the Way. I recognize him from some movies here, and he's a little bit older here. And Jeff, <laughs> it, as you'll watch this episode, if you do decide to watch it, Jeff is the comedic relief of this episode, I would say. Jeff really saves a lot of moments of this episode. And Jeff has this iconic one-liner, and he's like, It's Friday the 13th, and you're an idiot! <laughs> because he makes fun of Luke's neuroticism, and Luke's like obsession with superstitious, superstitions and stuff. And while uh, Jeff is scolding Luke... Uh, Gomez, who is the guy's name, Gomez is this big wrestler guy, unlike the book, where Stretch was his basketball player rival to Luke. In the episode, it's this guy named Gomez. And also, if you're a fan of the book, Hannah is nowhere to be found in this episode, just so you know. But uh, Gomez says he's going to beat him in the, in the wrestling match after school's over. And Luke is frustrated. He tries to open his locker... And it won't open. He's like, great, my locker's broken. And they go to the principal's office. And the principal gives him a new locker. It's locker 13. It has a combination. And when they find the locker, it's in this closed-off part of school. And it looks kind of creepy. Like an old janitorial hallway that nobody ever goes in. And there's just one single locker just standing there. And that's Luke's locker for the rest of the year. Unlike the book where... He's given the locker at the beginning of his, like, seventh grade year. So, while he's in the room, his friend Jeff is with him. Uh, Jeff notices that there's, like, a water fountain, so he's distracted. And Luke opens the locker and thinks he sees this reflection of this old man. And that freaks him out, and Jeff comes over, and they both look at the ground. And there's this, like, plastic toy charm thing that looks that looks like what you would find in like dollar tree and it says like a lucky charm or something and you know since luke is superstitious he's like why not he'll just hang on to it but as, as soon as he picks it up he starts to feel kind of weak and he starts to feel like he's going to faint and this is one of the changes you'll notice off the bat different from the book especially if you read the book is that that didn't happen in the book but from this point forward, the, the charm is insinuating that maybe it's taken some type of energy away from Luke. Once they leave the locker, they go out into the hallway, and Luke gets greeted by this girl who never gives him any time of day, and she invites him to her party that weekend. And, you know, he gets a kiss on the cheek from her, and Jeff's like, oh, maybe this is a good luck charm. And Luke realizes that, hey, this thing might work. So he unpackages it and throws the package into the trash. And he takes it with him to his wrestling match after school, which we see the, the coach character is played by the Keenan and Kel dad, which is really cool to see him in something else other than Keenan and Kel. So I, I, I got a big kick out of that, too. And he, of course, challenges Gomez, and he actually beats Gomez in a wrestling match. But after the wrestling match, he feels kind of weak when he gets home feels kind of tired and he gets his phone call and the phone call essentially tells him that he's won a hundred dollars from this sweepstakes contest and he's super excited about that and he hangs up the phone but then he grows weak again and he starts hearing these voices but he doesn't know what's up with the voices and then it cuts to um i guess that following monday after the uh party maybe he went to the party the episode never really shows the party uh that he was invited to by that girl He's at his locker, and while Jeff's getting a drink of water, he gets sucked into his locker, and there we meet the big villain of the story. And the story, 
reveals that this character who potentially left this charm behind was kind of the vision that Luke saw earlier on. And it's this being called the Fate Master. And the Fate Master is played by the same person who starred in the Phantasm movies back in the day. Which, he's a great actor. He has a really deep, ominous voice. Very good for horror. And you can tell he was kind of having fun with the character. And from here, it gets kind of good, right? So the Fate Master reveals that there's a toll for uh, Luke's good luck he had. And Luke's like, what do you mean? He's like, I need life energy. And now if you wish to live, you're going to have to give that charm to somebody else so I can take their energy. And Luke's like, who do, who do you want me to give this charm to? And the Fate Master reveals it's his best friend, Jeff. And Luke's like, I'm not going to give it to Jeff. And then the Fate Master's like, okay, well, if you won't give it to him, then I guess you'll die. So there's some real stakes here with Luke. And he has a moral decision to make whether he wants to give this charm to his best friend or willingly die to do what's right. And I think that was a good move to keep with the book. The book kind of had that message at one point, too. But in a different way. So Luke goes home. He's feeling weak. And Jeff comes to visit him, and Jeff's trying to cheer him up. He's going through his, going through his uh, good luck charms, and Luke um, hears the voice of the Fate Master saying, you know what you must do, and all of that. And, of course, he gets, he hears the voice, and he puts the charm in the backpack, and presumably Jeff walks off. Then immediately after that scene ends, it cuts to him yelling at the Fate Master or at his locker saying that, why am I still weak? And the Fate Master reveals that he knows that Luke double tried to double cross him and took the, took the charm out before Jeff could leave. So Jeff was lying, of course. Now going back to these other scenes that, Jeff's, uh, that uh, Luke's a part of in this episode, I did skip over one. And this scene, it comes right after you, you meet the t science teacher character a little bit a little bit in the middle of the episode. And there's this bathroom scene, right? And it's probably one of the scariest things this episode has to offer. Um, and he, he realizes that he can't get rid of the charm and he's, he's held on to it. And that led up to the Jeff reveal thing. Um, so... While watching this, when you see the bathroom scene, that's easily one of the best parts of the episode there. So after after that, and after he gets caught by the Fate Master, he's pretty much felt like he can't do much now. Um, he has this wrestling competition again with Gomez, and he's feeling weaker. And the Fate Master's essentially promised that he's going to use Gomez to beat him in a wrestling match. And while he's in science class, the teacher's talking about dissection, and they pretty much pick out a frog that's going to die. And Luke gets this idea. And I'm not going to say what the idea is, because I'll completely spoil the story. But from here, Luke has this idea, and it cuts to the wrestling match. He's still feeling kind of weak. But let's just say Luke tries to enact this plan. And I'm not going to say whether it gets pulled off or not, uh, but... There's an insinuation that there, like, there's like this big explosion near the end and it's supposed to signify that maybe this event has ended. And then the very ending kind of leaves some sequel bait there. Like maybe it didn't end the way we thought or maybe Luke's idea maybe worked and didn't work at the same time. I don't know how to explain it. I don't want to spoil exactly what it is, but that's where the episode leaves. And that's essentially the episode of Locker 13, right? So, really, um, I guess we'll get into the positives first. Um, Luke, uh, the, the, the actor who plays Luke, I'm going to dip into some negatives real quick. He's not a good actor. As a matter of fact, his delivery of lines is rather weak. <laughs> it, it, like, he's not a great actor. But Luke still holds that moral compass similar to what we see in the book. So I can be forgiving about the actor because I can see the character coming through. He even comes off more, um, he comes off with more ingenuity than he did with the book. So in some ways, I think Luke was slightly improved as a solo character, even though I think he has a way more satisfying arc in the book. So I, I gotta 
I got I got some enjoyment out of Luke a little bit. Jeff, he's hilarious. I love characters like Jeff. Jeff just puts Luke in his place, calls him out on his superstition crap, and how he's just so neurotic about it. Like, Jeff is the, probably the most realist person in this episode, to be honest. So, yeah, I really love Jeff. The Fate Master, great actor, great performance. The bathroom scene he was involved in, excellent stuff. Like, that should be the one golden thing about this episode to take away is that bathroom scene that was greatly done the music the the, the voice overwork the the effects all really came out in that scene um and like i said uh, i don't really have complaints with the fate master other than just like little plot nuances that the writer put in there or maybe even ron oliver did but i really had no complaints with the fate master on character basis gomez like these changes really come off unnecessary from the book. Like, I can kind of understand why they did wrestling. Because if you had the whole basketball thing, and you just cut out Hannah, um, that was like a really big pivotal moment in the book where, you know, Hannah played played basketball against Stretch. And I guess the change here works and make, makes him play a more solo sport. Cuts out the swimming stuff. Um, it kind of streamlines the episode. And some things I, I kind of agree with streamlining wise and some things i don't um but yeah now i guess we're getting into negatives let's talk about the streamlining first uh this episode is clearly <clears throat> a streamlined version or attempted in name only version of the book and it, and it shows it reflects budget the unnecessary changes just come off questionable um feels like there's no real thought into the changes yeah it's it's one of those things where some things work, some things don't. And the things that don't work are these character changes, and these characters don't really matter to the story. Like, Stretch actually mattered to the story in the book. Gomez does it here. And, and I hate comparing the books to the episodes, but some... Like, especially when the episode changes so much from the book that's actually good, and does it worse, I can't help but compare them, right? Um, another thing I take a huge issue with is the pacing of this episode. This this episode's pace is just ungodly fast. I've never seen anything this fast in Goosebumps. This episode just lightning quick. You really have to sit back and think about what's going on as it's happening because scenes are, they feel like they have ADHD. You have a bedroom scene and then a second after that scene ends, he's at his locker at school. It doesn't feel organic. And I think this is where the Ron Oliver negatives come out. I think Ron, I don't know if the script was laid out like this. I don't know if he edited it like this or the editors edited his work like this. But it just comes off so rushed. And it's hard to take a lot in because especially by the last like eight to ten minutes, it's trying to spitball these last minute ideas. And I guess we're getting into the, the second biggest negative here. The, the the energy concept is a is a cool change to streamline the episode but where i take issue with that is how loose the concept is by the end because of how the ending hap unfolds so luke gets this idea that maybe this energy concept can be done a little bit differently to manipulate the fate master into essentially i guess killing himself and i i don't i don't want to go any further than that that i didn't want to spoil it but that's as far as i'll go with that but by the end, they're sequel bait. So it feels like it was like all for nothing, I guess. And I, I don't know what else to say other than, wow. Like, really? You're going to go through all of that and then do that? It just makes no sense. I mean, it kind of does when you sit back and think about it. But it happens so fast because of the pace. It's hard to dissect all of that. Right? No pun intended, right? <laughs> and... I don't know. I don't. I really don't know what we're wrong. Like a, some bad, bad screenwriting with with the lines. I, I, going back to Richard Rosner, there's some really cringy one-liners in this episode. There's really bad lines. The teacher actress is kind of cringe. <laughs> like she's overacting for some reason, and this causes like a tonal clash. And I think. What happened, what happened with this episode was you have Ron Oliver, known for his like creative, out-of-the-box thinking episodes with a, a little bit of wild and zany plots, 
But then you have an ep a story here with genuine stakes. And for some reason, the, the Ron Oliverisms were clashing as opposed to how it usually goes with like the Goosebumps episodes with like the, the isms kind of connect in a way. I didn't feel like the comedy from being put from the screenwriting and Ron Oliver was meshing well with the plot. It just felt like it just didn't gel well. The story just overall comes out half-baked. It's just a kind of forgettable episode. And especially comparing it to the book. And like I said, I don't want to be comparing it to the book all that much. But especially comparing it to the book, it's, it's insulting almost of how good the book is. And then you watch this and you're like, this is the best they can come up with, right? I'm really disappointed with this episode, if I'm being honest. Very forgettable. If it's going to be memorable, it's for how baffling it is, especially by the end, um, and just all these issues it has. Um, the only episode I've seen from Ron Oliver hit this low for me is Vampire Breath. And since I can't decide which one is worse, I'm going to give it the same score as Vampire Breath, honestly, because I don't think it's good. I don't think it's bad. I think it's kind of mediocre. I think it's kind of fine, passable, okay, decent at best, all in one. And I don't want to give it too high of a score from my my usual 3 to 3.4 for something like this. I don't want to give it too high, and I don't want to give it too low. So I'm going to put it in the middle, and I'm going to give it a 3.2 out of 5. I deducted 1.8 off for just really medium to high hitting problems with this episode. Uh, not the best Ron Oliver episode ever. Like I said, I don't know if he's the total blame for this. I don't know if it's Richard Rosner for this. I don't know. Who to blame. But yeah, not a not a great episode. I wouldn't really recommend this episode unless you absolutely want to sit down and watch the whole Nightmare Room show. Then go ahead. But if you had an option and you're really considering it, just go read the book. So yeah, that's my thoughts on the Locker 13 episode. Let me know down in the comment section. Did you love this or did you hate this? I'm dying to know, and I'll see you next time.